Um, and yeah, it's 1.14. I want to make sure that we stay on schedule. I know that there's a lot of people that are still coming back from the breakout sessions. So um, we'll see a lot of people rejoining in just a couple of minutes here. And so, um, but without further ado, I want to take this time to formally introduce Noah Barnett. Uh, Chief Marketing Officer at Virtuous. Um, Noah is here to talk about understanding today's donor, how to design systems that build lasting relationships with all of your supporters. Um, so we're in for a treat. Noah is a fantastic speaker and presenter, and he has um, so much valuable information to share with us. So um, again, Noah, thank you for being here. Um, to Tell you a little bit more. So, um, Virtuous is the responsive fundraising platform designed to help you grow giving and create a personalized donor experience at scale. And Noah is also the co host of the Responsive Fundraising Podcast. Uh, previously, Noah spent 10 years in fundraising and marketing leadership roles at Cosbox, World Health, HubSpot, and the Adventure Project. He knows firsthand the challenges nonprofits face and is passionate about equipping them with the resources and insights they need to rally people around their cause. So Noah, thank you again for being here and we are all in for a treat. Um, this is going to be so great. I'm excited to hear what you have to share. Thanks, Candice. And thank you for such a warm re-welcoming back to the Causebox community. Uh, I've missed this. And so those that uh, don't know, I used to spend time working with Candice on the marketing strategy at Cosbox and just have a heart for the work that they do and grateful that you guys continue to curate these types of communities and environments. Um, I love interactive presentations. Um, and so if you have questions throughout, feel free to use the chat pane. I'm gonna go ahead and share some slides with you just so that we have a visual um, partner as we walk through today's presentation. Candice, can you see my slides okay? Yeah, they look great. Perfect. Well, as Candice mentioned, I'm going to be talking about uh, how do you really build systems that create deeper donor relationships at scale? And for us to really understand that, I want you to understand the posture that we're coming from and where um, our depth of research around understanding today's donor, but also helping nonprofits like yourselves really scale deep donor relationships comes from this commitment here at Virtuous to be a growth partner for nonprofit teams. You know, we are a software company, but we're committed to helping you and other nonprofits grow global generosity. And we do that not only through our fundraising platform, CRM marketing fundraising solutions, but also through our research, our playbooks, our hands-on support. And so I'm gonna share some of that with you today um, as we dig in. And what I feel grateful for here at Virtuous is we get to work with tons of leading nonprofits and that's not only, you know, a flex to say, look, we get to serve these customers, but it also shows uh, the opportunity we have at Virtuous, especially on the marketing team, to work side by side with organizations like Meals on Wheels or Habitat for Humanity or Mel Trotter and Comic-Con and others to really understand how they're navigating the same trials and challenges that you all are. And we get to learn from that, you know, across hundreds and hundreds of organizations and bring those insights to you today. So that's really where we've spent a lot of the bulk of our time is looking at nonprofits operators doing the work to understand how they're navigating the challenges of today's world. Because even though 2020 really rattled our fundraising industry, the same old challenges still exist around donor retention, uh, the rising cost of donor acquisition, and increased competition for attention. Ultimately, attention, as Candace and I used to say all the time yet when I was at Cosbox, is attention is the most valuable currency. And that remains so. If you look at the most valuable companies in the world, they are that because they've earned the attention and are stewarding that attention properly as they go forward. So we're going to navigate these challenges together as we dig through. But I wanted to set the stage for where some of this research is coming from and that opportunity that we have. And... I want to start with a story. I think all, what our work is all about in the you know doing good business, the for purpose business, is really about connecting supporters to a story. And so this little boy's name is Francis. I had the opportunity uh, through my work at World Help, which was an international development relief nonprofit, to spend a lot of time traveling around, visiting uh, communities that we served, whether we were providing education, housing, clothing. And Francis was a little boy that stuck out to me and continues to do so um, in my work uh, and, and really motivates me. Because 
when I met Francis, what I realized in that moment is that Francis is no different than my three boys, Luke, Eli, and Noah. His circumstances are different. The environment that he was born into is different. But him as a child, a child with hope and happiness and someone that's thriving and looking to make a difference and earn his place in the world is not different than the experiences I have with my own children. But through that, we get the opportunity to provide kids like Francis in my work in partnership with donors to provide them with education, housing, clothing, an opportunity to really feel safe. But the thing that hit me the most and what motivates me and to continue this work and to help individuals like yourselves continue the work that you're passionate about is something our program director said to me. And they said, do you know what you're really providing Francis? And I goes, I understand this is a rhetorical question. So no, I, I likely don't. We provide education, housing, clothing, shelter. What is it? And he goes, you're providing Francis the opportunity to dream again. And that single phrase has stuck out with me throughout my entire career and has motivated not only the work I do here at Virtuous and did at Cosvox, but what we do to serve other nonprofits. And I encourage others to think about the stories in their own lives that have motivated you to get into this work. And so as I share my story about Francis, I hope you're reflecting on your own story in your own life and are able to answer the question, like, why do you do the work that you do? And I would invite you to take it a step further and think about your supporters, those donors that have given sacrificially to your organization and see that for them, it's also personal. And we know this both personally, we see this in our supporters that giving is deeply personal. Yet, the unfortunate reality is that most nonprofits are actually handcuffed to traditional fundraising systems that are largely impersonal. Now you can see the challenge in this. And if we break this down and really unpack kind of a visual representation of today's fundraising, is that it truly is largely impersonal. The fundraising tactics you and I were taught are based on one-to-many spray and pray tactics, one-way communication, the nonprofit's timing, impersonal and really disconnected from intent. Because if we step over and maybe you're a Cosbox user, maybe you uh, raise money through peer-to-peer -peer fundraising or digital fundraising, uh, maybe you're not and you just have individuals that give to you because they're passionate for the cause or they found you via Facebook or their story resonated. Regardless, it was personal that they connected. And then as we dump them into our donor base, we begin to cultivate them in a very impersonal way. And it shouldn't be shocking to you, and it isn't to me, that the average retention, those donors that will give to you again, is under 25%. And it continues to decrease and hasn't changed in over a decade, outside of continuing to decline. This is a challenge, but it's a systematic challenge. It's not a challenge of socialization because we've done that well off. Um, I've hosted many of summits, many of trainings. Candice and the Cosvox team have hosted many of trainings. You've already heard many speakers during this summit talk about it, but we can't just socialize it because that's not moving the needle on the problem. We have to see this as a systematic problem of fundraising and we have to rethink how we even fundamentally approach that because today's donor is demanding something different. And now more than ever, it's essential that we solve this problem so that we can continue to grow generosity and move the impact of your causes forward. So we're gonna unpack this a little bit more. So we can't just say, okay, well, no, I see the problem. You've illustrated that. Giving is deeply personal. Fundraising is relatively impersonal. And that's a systematic challenge. And this isn't just around new donors. This is also around ongoing donors, where most nonprofits turn over more than 50% of their donors a year. Even if you're different than that, you know deep down that you should be doing better with donor retention and retaining more donors. But the most discouraging stat that we saw when we were doing research in partnership with Giving USA and the India University Lilly Family School of Philanthropy is that if we look back over a decade and exclude 2020, which I'll address, the last decade, we've seen a 25% decrease in the number of donors even contributing to charity. Now, I just want to say that again, because I think it's super important to realize is that the number of donors giving to charitable organizations have decreased 25% over the last decade. So it's not that just donors are not giving to you and giving to another organization or not giving to another organization and giving to you, but rather they're opting out because they're not finding that connection. And when we 
double click a little bit further and ask why, it's due to inappropriate asks and impersonal messaging, lacking acknowledgement and transparency. And you might say, but Noah, there's these macro trends, the tax laws have changed. We went through a global recession that all of these different things have changed the landscape. That's why people aren't giving. But that doesn't reflect the data. The data actually progresses across those, even in high times, we, in, in prosperous times, we've seen decreases. And so the challenge comes back is that there are external factors and we could lean on those and say, this isn't my problem. This is a, uh, a, an, a macro issue that I can't solve for. But if we're truly passionate about moving this work forward and supporting and building better relationships with our supporters, we need to see that there are opportunities for us to reorient our fundraising so that we can build better and not just build better relationships with our donors so we raise more money, but so that we can build better communities, better homes, better climates, better environments that are, give opportunities for flourishing for all people. This is what's at stake, and this is why we call it a generosity crisis, and we're so passionate about this work here at Virtuous, not only evangelizing it, but being part of the solution. How do we help organizations build better? And that's what we're at pursuing here at Virtuous, both in our education, and in our commitment on the technology side. So Paul Batalden um, says this perfectly, is that this isn't a matter of socialization, but it's every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. So the reality of this are bleak, but we have to acknowledge that it's a byproduct of how we approach our role as fundraisers. But it also presents an opportunity because we have the ability to stand up and to take action and rethink and reorient ourselves towards a different way to design systems that are gonna help you scale donor relationships. And that's what we're gonna talk about. I hope this hasn't been discouraging, but informative so far, because we were gonna build on this foundation as we begin to dive forward into the rest of the presentation, where we're gonna workshop this together, you and I, to shoulder to shoulder to think, how can we build better together? The first thing we need to understand as we kind of pursue this progress is that the world you fundraise in has changed. It's evolved from a then to a now. And the challenge with this is that it hasn't changed and we just need to reorient ourselves, is that it's changing continuously. And so we're always being disoriented and having to reorient. And so rather than pursuing orientation, we need to design our systems that are resilient regardless of the challenges we're on. We need to move, as Jason Lewis says, we need, to, we need to lay down our pursuit of efficiency and pick up arms and take them into exploration. That's what is required from a mindset standpoint as we move into this new reality and continue forward in 2021 and beyond. Now, the question is, what are the macro changes? If it's changing all the time, Noah, like how do we even keep up? How do we even know what to do? Well, the good thing is, is that there's some underlying notes to what's changing, and they fall back on two specific changes that are orienting the entire experiences both you and I are a part of, and the expectations of the donors that you're trying to engage. And that's this, is that we've gone, gone through this evolutionary shift from mass broadcast media, where there's a single source of truth, to one that is personalized to your own experiences and your own interactions with it. Now, what does that mean? What that really means is that content isn't presented at you. It's actually rather presented to you and is personalized to you. So if I go on Spotify today, my experience is gonna be different than if Candace or Jenna or you jump on Spotify. But it's not limited to just entertainment like Spotify or Netflix. It's actually personalized in finance, in retail, in travel, in education in retail. All of these different fields have been fundamentally shifted to be personalized, and there's a constant pursuit to that. Now, we can understand that, you know, yes, I agree. When I log into Spotify, it's different. When I log into Netflix, it's different. When I go to Amazon, it's different. That is the first massive shift that we're continuing to press into, and it's impacting all areas of our lives. The second change, I believe, is almost more important and it's more challenging, and I don't feel like we've fully gotten it right in any sector, let alone philanthropy, in that it's not personalized, but yet still fixed 
but rather it's, it's responsive and evolving. So that when I go into Spotify, it's not that it's just different than Candace's, but that as I interact with it, it's responding back to me. And so this way of two-way behavior-driven experiences are really driving um, towards the future. And we see you know, big headlines around organizations trying to figure out how to approach this because it's just the expectation of our culture. And I don't think it's unfounded or a, uh, a trend. I do believe that deep down as humans, we do things that are personalized and we need to, we want to engage in those personalized experiences. And we also want to not just be a consumer, we want to be a participant. I think technology has enabled us to get there and to be able to deliver on those expectations, but I don't think they're new or just trends, but they're actually innate into kind of our human desires and experiences. So these are the macro trends. As the world you fundraise in is changing, these are the big trends that we need to keep an eye on. And so the question then becomes is like, as this personalization really impacts all aspects of our lives, what is our role as supporters, as fundraisers, um, to lean into these trends as well and, 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 and allow our fundraising to actually mirror the same types of personalization and responsiveness uh, that we're seeing in other aspects of our lives. Now, the other thing that's shifted that we need to keep in mind on is COVID-19. Uh, 2020 was filled with uh, a global pandemic, calls of social uprising across multiple um, uh, classes of people and uh, of types of people where it says, hey, we are we deserve rights, we deserve uh, a place at the table, we need to be respected. It was also a year where climate change was progressing, uh, you know, huge impacts. And so not only COVID, but climate and social uprisings and this demand for us to address this from a justice perspective um, has really shaped our culture. And what's interesting about 2020 is it, it, that's different than other moments in time where there has been uh, uh, huge impacts, like macro level impacts or crises, is that it truly impacted everybody globally. And so we will always know a world that was pre-COVID and post-COVID. And we need to consider that as we think about, well, how has that reshaped what supporters care about and what they want to invest in um, as we think about that? So it's not just personalization, it's not just responsive, but it's also this reshaping and reorientation of the heart of the individual towards looking to find purpose because we were all presented with this life or death scenario in various capacities, but it was always present to all people globally. So you're likely sitting like this right now in front of your computer where you're like, oh gosh, like there's a lot of challenges. There's a generosity crisis. There's um, the only certain thing is uncertainty and 2020 COVID climate and calls for social change are swirling around, like how do I even orient myself as we move forward? Well, we're gonna spend the next 30 minutes really diving into that because I think we need to move from this to a place where we can actually thrive. Because as Seth Godin says, some organizations will actually thrive from this increased chaos, some will be unprepared and some will merely fight it and lose. And my intent, my hope, and I know Candice and the Cosbox team's hope is that through content, through collective learning, we'll be able to create uh, for you, an opportunity to thrive amidst this chaos. The chaos is there. It's just a matter of how you are going to respond to it as an individual, as a team, and as an organization. So let's get into it. We're going to ask two important questions as we navigate through the rest of this question or this conversation. One is, what can we do to close the gap? If there's an increasing gap between giving being deeply personal and this expectation of personal engagement and how traditional fundraising uh, was taught to you and I, how do we actually close that gap? How do we bring the giver and the good closer together? How do we better bridge the gap between our supporters, our stakeholders, and our story? That's a question we're going to answer together. The second question is, is that as we pursue that, we're going to find clear answers, but you have to actually go execute. You have to change. You have to desire to move forward. And we're going to talk about some tactical ways that you can do that. Because it's not just about knowing how to close the gap, but implementing it and overcoming the innate inertia that will be presented to you and your organization. So let's make a plan. And what's key about this picture, not just because it's my child and he's incredible, 
and uh, his name is Eli, um, but rather because he's writing in pencil. And so I think as we move forward through this, you should pick up a pencil and keep a large pink eraser very handy. Because as we navigate an uncertain world, if we're, if we're truly pursuing exploration rather than efficiency, to Jason Lewis's point, we need to do it in pencil. We still need to create a plan, but writing it in pencil is gonna enable us to evolve and change as we learn. So let's make this plan. First and foremost, there's this beautiful quote by the founder of Save the Children that I truly think encapsulates. If I was gonna give you a mantra or a, a mission to kind of hold tight to and to look at every morning as you're pursuing uh, your mission is this, is that we as fundraisers, you and I, Candace, Jenna, others, are required to devise a means of making known the facts in such a way as to touch the imagination of the world. Now this next point is key. The world is not ungenerous, but unimaginative and very busy. And to illustrate my point, I wanna point back to 2020. I had mentioned that in our research that kind of identified this generosity crisis that we saw in the past decade, excluding 2020, that there was a 25% decrease in the number of people giving to charity. However, the bright spot that proves this point that the world is not ungenerous is that in 2020, the year that individuals were challenged most in varieties of ways at different capacities, but we were all challenged, generosity still showed up. The number of giving went up, the number of donors and individuals giving to charity went up. So in the midst of darkness, generosity was resilient. And that's a powerful thing. And I think that proves the point that the world is not ungenerous, but unimagined and very busy. And when we're pushed, when we're presented with the facts in such a way as that it touches our imagination, we do respond. And so it's not a matter of finding new supporters that care or reforming your story, but it's about the strategies and the systems that you implement to close the gap between those two things as we move forward. And that's on you and I as fundraisers, as nonprofit leaders to do. So first principle of fundraising, I just went over this, but hey, you have a set of supporters, you have a set of systems, and those are gonna connect those supporters to the story. And likewise, the story is gonna connect back to the supporters. If we're successful at fundraising, we are accomplishing this. And so now we're gonna double click on the system side of this and say, well, how do we know if we're being successful? Because if we're rethinking fundraising, we need to rethink the measurement at which we evaluate our fundraising. So there's four key uh, metrics that you wanna make sure you note down. You should be discussing and socializing with your team and really planning to build towards every single day, every single week, every single quarter and year. The first of those is acquisition. You know, how you engage new donors with your nonprofit's impact. The second is retention. How do you build lasting relationships and earn donor loyalty? The third is cultivation. How do you really deepen engagement each donor has with your cause? And ultimately, which I think is fundamental to the work that Cosbox does and their desire to help organizations is as advocacy. How frequently are your donors referring others to support your cause and how are you activating them intentionally? So these are the measurements and areas that we can leverage to know if we're being successful as we head forward into 2021 and beyond. So now how are we gonna approach this? We know what we need to measure, but how are we actually gonna approach this? Um, and what we see is that we do see nonprofits are accelerating their growth model and closing the gap with the modern donor by adopting what we refer to as responsive fundraising. Um, and Candace, I know this wasn't planned, but I would love to, at the end, give away free copies of our published book called Responsive Fundraising that Gabe Cooper wrote. And so we can do that at the end. I would love to give some copies to the audience today. Yeah, absolutely. That sounds awesome. Thanks, man. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'll give some more details. So if you want a book, you have to stick around for the whole presentation. But we'll give some instructions at the end that you can shoot me an email and I'll mail you a copy. Uh, no problem. But I'm going to unpack just a primer on it today with the, the remaining time we have, which is that growing nonprofits are actually using responsive technology and tactics to really connect personally with each donor. And so when we're approaching acquisition, when we're approaching retention or cultivation or advocacy, we're doing that through this donor-centric model of responsive fundraising. And the powerful thing, because I'm gonna go into each of these uh, phases about responsive fundraising is it starts with listening and it ends with learning and repeating over the process. So as we listen, as we connect personally with our donors, as we make suggestions, 
we're monitoring the response to that. And then we're listening again. And hopefully you've seen the clear illustration as if we take the responsive fundraising framework and we map it back to the two challenges in the macro trends that we're seeing in our industry, where there's an expectation of personalization and there's an expectation of responsive experiences that are two way. You can see how this model is gonna enable you and your nonprofit to be able to do that and approach that. Whether it's an acquisition campaign or a cultivation campaign, the responsive fundraising framework will be able to help you. So let's double click and click into each of these about listening, connect, suggest, and learn. Oops. Uh, for illustration, what this looks like, I've already talked a little bit about this, but we'll just use Lisa's story as an example where, hey, Lisa attended a virtual event. And so you send her a thank you email with a survey on her interests. Then you might send a thank you call from your team or an SMS from the programs team based on their interests. And then Lisa visits the website. Now Lisa's just exploring, she's looking around, she's trying to learn more about your organization and she's grateful for that. You've closed the loop with her, but she actually leaves your website and you're able to, you know that you've been listening, you're engaging with her about her intent and her timing. And then you send her an email with a donation ask based on the page Lisa's visited. So she visited your, you know, help dogs and cats get homes uh, discovery page. And so you send her an appeal that invites her to be a part of that. Or it's about your alumni support program that supports scholarships, or maybe it's about helping provide clean water to communities in Ghana. Lisa actually then comes to your website and gives, and then you actually are able to send a postcard closing the loop on impact. Now, I hope you're like me when I hear this story, I'm like, a little jealous of this experience. Like when I give, when I contribute, I would love to have this experience. I think that reinforces the point that as individuals, giving is deeply personal and we want to have a personalized connection to the cause that we're working on. And we also want the organization that's working on that cause to be responsive and continuing to invite me in to be a part of the impact. Now, this is what responsive fundraising is trying to create. And so if you blossom this out a little bit further and you start talking about not just first-time givers like Lisa to an event, but also Tim who gave a first gift to a water campaign. You have a new donor welcome journey. Or you have Rhonda who actually abandons your donation page, but she showed intent to give. How are you cultivating her with that? How are you being responsive and personalizing that? Or for Lynn, she hasn't given in 13 months, but you don't know if she feels disconnected. You might call her a lapsed donor, but she might feel like an adv advocate and supporter. How are you engaging with her based on that understanding and driving her through and forward? And last, James might just be looking around and engaging in a quiz about uh, women empowerment and providing dignity to women. Or it could be he's downloading a PDF that's kind of unpacking the advocacy program on the policies that you're trying to put forth in San Francisco. Either way, all of this is inviting you to be responsive in how you connect with them. And that's what responsive fundraising enables you to do, is to align your cultivation and retention programs with the personal connection that they had for your cause. And that re responsive fundraising approach actually drives up retention, drives up average gift, and increases engagement. And we know that, and I can say that confidently because we see it every day in the customers we get to work alongside here at Virtuous. So let's get into a little bit further. We're going to talk about each of these layers, starting with listening. So the responsive fundraising starts with listening, because for us to be truly personal and truly responsive, we have to actually understand the individual or the group that we're connecting with or the segment. And so listening is about asking questions, finding out uh, why donors have given, and identifying what we call donor signals. And those things are going to enable you to be able to create donor personas or uh, more proper segmentation. You're also going to be able to capture more information and intent through surveys and third party data like wealth data from donor search or others. But then you're also going to be able to be incorporating digital behavior tracking. So if someone comes to your website, do you know what pages they're visiting? Do you know why they're there? Do you know what emails they clicked on? Do you know, can you associate that data back to what they've given to historically? All of these donor signals are going to help you become more responsive. And it's actually what you experience every day, whether you're on Spotify or Amazon or Netflix, or you get an email from Stitch Fix or J. Crew. All of that is starting with listening and then curating that personal connection. And that's where responsive really dives in. 
So I'll give you a few examples of the signals that you should be listening for. There's three types of donor signals you want to be listening for. The first is involvement. So how is an individual engaged with you? So in Emma's case, she's an active donor for four years, volunteers often. In Luke's case, he's a first-time donor. He attended a virtual event and he gave $500. That's involvement. If you're a traditional fundraising um, leader and you are familiar with RFM or some of those segmentation models, that's encapsulated in this idea of involvement. Now, the next layer, which RFM has actually evolved to be like RFMME, which involves engagement, is around interest. So you have involvement and then you have interest. What they engage with. So Emma actually gives monthly to support women's programs where Luke requests more information about child advocacy programs and child adoption. Now, what's great about as you begin to track and view segmentation through these different signals is that you'll find that there's a bunch of Emmas and there's a bunch of people that mirror like Luke. They're still individuals, but they're mirroring the same signals, which helps you form better segmentation. The last and most difficult signal to track is intent. Why are they engaging? And this really requires you to be intentional and go ask. And that's what we did when I was at World Health, where we said, hey, we know what the involvement is with these organizations or these individuals. We know their interests. They're in interested in our child development programs that Francis, are a part, Francis was a part of. But what's their intent? Why do they give? Why do they continue to give? And what motivates them? And so we just did a survey. And we found out that there was clear macro reasons, that there was kind of common threads amongst the responses, which we were then able to leverage and use to help grow and build better relationships with those individuals and those segments. But we were also then able to pull those out and put them into an acquisition campaign where we're able to step aside. And instead of us talking about why our organization mattered and why you should give to this organization, we let our supporters do it. And Seth Godin, who I referenced earlier, says, you know, people want to know what people like them do. So tell me what people like me do and engage with. And that's what listening really enables you to do is you can actually reflect back intents that are common amongst your current supporter base, whether it's 10 or 10,000. And that can invite and create an easier path for other supporters to connect with your story. So listening isn't just about cultivation retention, but also can be brought into your acquisition campaigns and advocacy. So that was listen. That's the foundation and starting point for all things responsive. The second thing is connect. And so connect is just the opportunity for you to connect in a personal way at the right time. You know, HubSpot, um, who uh, puts out just brilliant content on marketing, you know, one of their leaders said, you really want to send the right thing at the right time to the right person. That's relevancy. And so this idea of connection is rather than orienting around your timeline, like, oh, it's November, I'm going to send my Thanksgiving appeal. You're rather orienting around the timing of the supporter. And so that could be this donor, Candace, just gave to us. I should do something. I should connect personally with that because I'm listening. Or it could be that Jenna has actually supported your organization for two years now. And now Jenna might not remember what she did in July 20, or 2019, two years ago, but you do because you know that Jenna took a leap of faith and stepped up and supported your organization. And you can use that milestone to actually re reference back to Jenna and say, hey, Jenna, you've been partnering with us for two years. You took a chance at that event and stepped up and said, I want to be a part of this. That's how you can connect personally. And that's truly personalized and being responsive. So this is using things like marketing automation to create dynamic campaigns rather than static campaigns, using content marketing to provide relevant content to drive people further and connect them more closely with your cause and your story. And it also requires you to do multi-channel. We live in a world that's not oriented around, I have my digital life and I have my offline life, but those areas are graying. And so for you to truly be responsive and connect, you have to do it through multiple channels. So it's not just about me emailing Candace or texting Jenna, but it might be sending Candace a postcard showcasing a beautiful visual of her impact that she can put up on her fridge and say, I'm a part of that. It could be actually sending her a mail piece and then an email that complement each other. It's multi-channel, but it's single conversation. And that's truly how you become more responsive. 
here's a great example of an automated new donor onboarding workflow. So new donor gives to you, you might tag them as a new donor, send them an email, uh, assign a task for someone to follow up with them. You might send them a text message or even send them a letter appeal that uh, talks about how they can become an adoption champion on a monthly basis through monthly giving. All of this is a way for you to begin to connect in a personal way. Another example, which I've already shared uh, with uh, using Jenna as the uh, test case is donor giving milestones. So it could be a year. So it could be, like I said, with Jenna, she's given you to you for two years and partnered with you, or it could be that she just gave her last gift that now she's partnered with you and given $5,000 to your organization. Wow, that's significant. Let's leverage that moment to connect with her in a personal way, acknowledge what she's done, and then bridge the gap to what she could do, which leads us in to the last part of the response or the third part of the responsive framework, which is suggest. So as I'm listening and as I'm connecting personally, I also want to make relevant suggestions. And I'll illustrate this through a story in my own life. Um, my partner, Becca, is traveling this week um, for her job, and I had extra free time because my kids are also at camp. And so I was like, you know what? I want to watch a documentary. So I searched documentaries to watch in 2021. I ended up realizing that Hulu had the new WeWork documentary, which talks about the rise and fall of the WeWork empire. Um, and it was interesting and brilliant. Now, I engaged in this content. And now, Hulu has the opportunity to listen to that and say, okay, Noah engaged with this. He watched the whole thing because we have that data. Uh, this documentary aligns with startup stories, uh, kind of a rise and fall, you know, David versus Goliath, like who's going to win? How is this going to play out? It's real life. So they have all these interesting things that they now know about me. Now they can actually come back to me, connect with me personally and say, hey, how did you like that WeWork documentary? Um, others have said X, Y, and Z. Would you like to leave a review? But they can also make a suggestion. That's this step here is you want to make relevant or present relevant next steps. And now this doesn't replace the traditional fundraising ask, but it's a compliment to that. Because if I'm coming alongside you, in this case, let's say it's Candace, and saying, hey, Candace, you've partnered with us in this way. Individuals like you are so important to our mission and helping to bridge the gap on a, B, and C water issue. Typically, individuals that take the first step then take one of these three actions. Here's what that means and here's what that looks like and we're inviting you to be a part of it. Now I'm positioning myself and you can do the same as a guide for the supporter to connect closer to the story, which we know from research drives retention. And so that's where the suggest comes in. You can use smart giving options. So you're saying, hey, I'm not going to ask Candace for $100. I'm going to ask her for $50 monthly. Or it could be, hey, I'm going to ask David, who just joined our call, um, for $5,000. Or I'm going to you know, ask Jeff Bezos to stop going to space and instead give money away. You know, like Whatever it is, you can do these smart engagements, these smart asks um, in how you present financial things. But it also doesn't have to be a financial ask. It can, all, it can be a next step ask. It could be inviting someone to a town hall, a virtual town hall to learn more with your programs team that are on the ground uh, in the community or to meet the people that actually care for the animals every single day that we're trying to adopt out as, an ad, as a team, as a collective, as a friends of the pets. Or it could be a climate change activist. It's on the front lines of policy every single day in Washington, D.C. And you want to create a connection with them. So you can invite someone to be a part of that. It also could be for advocacy, for social proof. There's a lot of different next steps that you can invite someone to do. But it's about continuing that conversation and making relevant suggestions. So I want to share this last example before we dive into the last part um, of the conversation, I'll turn it over to David to kind of talk about how do you actually turn this into action? You know, we've talked conceptually about like, what are the strategies that we can use to connect supporters more closely to our story? How do we do that in a responsive way? The next question is like, okay, I get that. I believe in that. But now the question becomes, how do I execute that? How do I implement that here at my organization? I want this. And so David's going to come on and share more about that. But I want to share this last example by an organization called WOTC. They believe that universal healthcare access should be accessible for everyone. 
and especially those in impoverished communities that don't have access to the same care that many of us do in a developed economy and environment. And so what they do is they invite donors to actually sponsor healthcare opportunities for uh, individuals through a network of doctors and healthcare uh, facilities in these developing communities. And they sent this email. And I think what's interesting about this email is you can use it as a template for your next email. And so I'm gonna walk through it and kind of dissect it uh, and share how it embodies the, all the principles of being responsive. So first and foremost, Kyle is the donor in this case, and Kyle has contributed previously to WOTC um, to help uh, provide care uh, for children. And so WOTC sends this email to Kyle and says, hey, Kyle, meet Peter. Peter, in this case, is a doctor that lives in Guatemala that's actually providing life-saving care to children like Estella. But Peter could also just be a program delivery person. So if you're an animal shelter, it could be, you know, hey, uh, Wes, who works in our care facilities, or it could be someone in the alumni office that gets to see students come to campus every year, uh, or it could be a healthcare professional that is actually serving children that have life-threatening cancer and gets to partner with their families as they walk through that journey. Either way, Kyle's the donor, Peter is the program delivery person. So Kyle, meet Peter. We're already bridging the gap between the supporter and the story and the impact. Peter leads the team that cared for Estella. Estella is a new character in this and Estella is actually the beneficiary. So you have the donor, Kyle, Peter, the program delivery, and then Estella, who's the individual that's being cared for. The patient from Guatemala you supported and he wrote you this note. Very personal, very connected to something Kyle already knows and does. The beautiful part about this intro is that they're starting with what Kyle did and then working to a suggestion. So they've listened now they're connecting personally. Now the note says, Kyle, you and Watsi have done something special. That's the first note to Watsi, uh, which has allowed us to say yes to patients like Estella. So Estella is a symbol in this case for all the other children that Peter and his team are able to care for in Guatemala. Uh, thanks for being a part of this journey with us. Now this last part is brilliant. And I think this is where this, the, the beauty and the suggestion comes into play is that they said this Valentine's Day support one of Peter's patients and dedicate the donation to someone you love, view patients. So Kyle's the donor, Peter's the program delivery person, Estella is the beneficiary. And all of these are symbols of varieties of stakeholders that you also have at your organization. And instead of presenting it as, hey, this Valentine's Day support Watsi's programs, or hey, this Valentine's Day provide healthcare to children in need, or hey, this Valentine's Day help our Guatemala programs thrive. They said, no, you know, support one of Peter's patients. This idea of connection remains, they retain the narrative that the suggestion is context or contextually relevant to the initial touch. And I think it's beautifully executed and something that you and your organization can actually leverage in your next email fundraising uh, or your next fundraising email. So with that note, we've already talked about the responsive system. You need to use responsive fundraising to listen, connect, suggest. The donor growth model, which is acquisition, retention, cultivation, and advocacy. You need a dynamic playbook that has personas and campaigns. It's multi-channel and single conversation. And you're uh, orienting your fundraising around the donor's journey, not your own organizational timeline. The last part of this is the technology platforms and how you actually do this. And so uh, David's gonna come up and share a little bit more of how organizations using Virtuous are, are doing this. Um, because we all have a choice, you know, we have the Morpheus uh, view where you got to pick the red pill or the blue pill, because we have the opportunity to carry on and just realize that the generosity cross crisis is a byproduct of how fundraising works. It just is what it is. Or we have the opportunity to be responsive and actually move to more of a dynamic, personal, multi-channel approach. And the choice is really yours, but our hope, and I know um, it's our team at Virtuous's hope is that we can help enable together more responsive organizations because we're committed to growing global generosity. So I'm gonna turn it over to David because he's really gonna help us unpack how we go about doing this. David, welcome. Thank you, Noah. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. I will get my screen going. And like Noah said, well, we're gonna take the dive into Virtuous and start to see practically how some of these concepts and ideas can start to be implemented and what this means from a technology standpoint. 
so let's let's dive in and let's get going here. All right, so you should see my screen now. Um, and where we're at right now is at the Virtuous dashboard. So the first place you'd come to get the day started. And I, I really want to talk through and walk through the system thinking about the ideas of responsive fundraising. How do we listen well? How do we then connect and build trust over time and then suggest the right next step that's more in line with that person's capacity, their passions, um, and their superpowers? And so at a high level, Virtuous is a nonprofit focused CRM. We also bring in marketing capabilities, full automation capabilities, uh, a suite of online giving and online tools to be able to have a great digital front facing experience. Um, and then a wealth of signals. So additional data appends to give you a bigger picture of who a donor is. So let's move on from the dashboard and let's just dive right into a donor record because Really here is where we start to get a sense of, well, how can we using technology listen better and get a bigger, more holistic picture of who a donor is? So in this case, we're looking at um, a household record, Joshua and Cheryl. Now, like any good CRM, we're gonna track all the table stakes that you'd need to uh, track. They're giving history, contact information, all the touch points that we've had with them. But how do we start to think about a bigger view uh, of every donor. So one way that we do that is through signals. Virtuous is able to bring in additional data uh, around every single person in your database. One of those ways is actually here through social insight. So if you have an email address for anyone on file, Virtuous is actually going to automatically scrape, pull back things like social profiles, pictures, and anything we can find from a demographic perspective on the web. So one way that starts to help here is now within the system, I have things like Cheryl's Twitter handle embedded right into this UI. But even as we start to think about how do we use this into the future, right? Well, maybe we've got this big upcoming event and instead of asking just Josh and Cheryl to attend and, and sign up, what if we grabbed everyone in the database that we knew had a Twitter account and when we sent out that email, we actually replaced the register button with the share button and gave them an opportunity to share it to their larger network. Differentiating the ask, tapping into their superpowers and starting to give donors an opportunity to respond in different ways. So very simple way that we can start to do that. Social insights is a great way to start to see a bigger picture. Um, other things to kind of point out here, we want to know how this donor is interacting with us across the organization. Right? Donors have one experience with us. And, and, and again, I use the word donor loosely. We like to also use the word giver at Virtuous because it implies that people have more to give beyond just financial transactions, right? They might have advocacy, volunteerism, networking, right? Lots of ways to give. And so even here, I'm able to track their event attendance, their volunteer attendance to get a bigger picture of where they're engaging across the organization. Um, other signals as well as we start to think about outside data that can be helpful here is wealth data. Well, what is their financial capacity? What's their giving across other organizations? When we start to understand their giving patterns outside of our organization, now we can figure out and identify the best ask financially for them within Virtuous as well. Relationships is a great way to start to understand the interconnectedness of our uh, our records, our donors. So who are their friends? Where do they go to work? Coworkers, other relationships here. A couple other things to point out because we are a full marketing system as well. One of the advantages is not only can I see things like the giving and all these you know social and wealth information, but I can also start to see things like our email communications. If I sort out my my list here, I'll be able to see just specifically how they're opening and interacting with our content. I can see that Josh is engaging in our Giving Tuesday emails and clicking these links. And one other really cool way is you start to think about your own website, right? You've created a website, you're creating great content on there. Folks are coming to your website to read about your blogs, your impact areas, the stories that you're providing. And so wouldn't it be great if, right, on your website, maybe you're talking about the work you're doing in Monument Valley, Utah to help clean up the area. But wouldn't it be great to know if David here was coming to visit your website and specifically what, what cause areas, what pages of the website is he most curious in, uh, about? So I can start to see what pages 
donors are interacting with. And wouldn't it be great, right, if the next day I got an email that was specifically aligned to the, the Monument Valley, Utah project that you have going on now and is talking about the content in that area. So lots of ways that we're bringing in outside data to help give a bigger picture, right? But that's, that's one aspect, right? Having data in the system is really important, but the next piece is, well, how do we use this now? How do we take the data and insights and start to put them into action to build relationship, differentiate our ask, engage the donor, right? And so that all kind of thinking about the second tenet of responsive fundraising is connect. We have to listen first, understand motivations, who they are, what makes them tick, all of these different areas. Now we have to connect. Well, a big part of that happens on the marketing side here at Virtuous. And we're going to look at a couple different use cases. Now, I'm a big believer. I see some of the Q&A coming in. We want to start small. We want to start simple. We want to make sure that we can create things like a donor journey, um, an engagement that we can be consistent in. So let me show you a couple automations and examples that are really helpful as you think about, well, how do we take the data we have and use it in a way to, to build donor relationships? So think about automation. It's a workflow builder. You tell Virtuals what to do, and it just does it. And here's a really good example of a workflow in Virtuous. Now, this is something that you may already be trying to do today. Uh, the workflow that we're looking at right now in Virtuous this one is all designed to honor and recognize donors as they reach certain life to date giving milestones with us. So you might be thinking today, you know, when a donor reaches that $5,000 threshold of their overall giving, we really would love to call them, maybe have the executive director write a note. And so there are milestones, right? As you think about that donor's journey and those different steps that they could take, what do we want to happen? And so this is a great use case that will essentially honor and recognize donors at those steps. So this is purely an example, but in this case, we've built this workflow to say, hey, at $1,000, $5,000, or $10,000 in life today giving, we want these actions below here to just trigger automatically. So you build your workflow in Virtuous, you tell us what steps you want to happen, and now this just sits and waits and runs in the background. So at any point in time, a donor hits that $1,000 milestone, now these actions are gonna start triggering. One thing you'll notice is Virtuous might automatically tag that record with a specific tag. So now you can segment and sort out your database because the system is automatically doing it for you. Then you'll see we're gonna trigger an email to be sent. Virtuous is a full marketing system. So not only can it replace tools like Constant Contact and MailChimp for just your ad hoc email, your monthly newsletter, but now we can start to do it for automated emails. So what if we wanted an email like this to just go out at any time a donor reaches the threshold? So this is our email builder, right? If I wanted to drag in a new button, if I wanted to change the look and feel, upload my images, really easy to create these templates here. But now this could be something that's specifically targeted and sent out in the moment that it matters to the donor. You'll see several other things start to happen as well. Maybe we create a task for a development rep to follow up and call them. So that's, again, it's in the moment. You're not running a report 30 days later. You're not making sure you, you, you have your spreadsheet ready. You're going to get a, a, a notification on your phone that Virtuous just created a task for you to call. And now you can do it in the moment on that same day. No one mentioned the idea of multi-channel, and I'll show you another example of this as well. But you'll see that there's this postcard being sent. So this is a very unique concept in Virtuous. We actually can create, just like you would an email, and templatize that. You can actually templatize and build direct mail pieces, whether letters for thank you notes or receipts, or even postcards in this example, where we want to actually send out a custom postcard to this donor to say, hey, thank you so much for reaching this milestone. We're so appreciative. And the neat part is this is automatically printed, shipped, and delivered on your behalf through Virtuous, fully automated direct mail pieces to be able to create multi-channel experiences. So we talked a little bit about this idea with life-to-date giving. 
Here's another really good, simple example. New donor welcome series. It's one of the really common use cases we want to ensure happen. When a brand new donor comes on file, we want to welcome them and onboard them to the organization. Now, the cool part about Virtuous is you can start to get more and more specific. Maybe that new donor gave to your capital campaign. Maybe that new donor gave to uh, your uh, project for, for digging wells um, in, right, in, uh, in, in Malawi. Right? Whatever the area is, cause area, we can even differentiate this. But I wanted to point out this, right? This is a workflow that's even differentiating it by their gift size. But one thing that's really cool is the ability for Virtuous to send automated text messages. So full multi-channel donor journeys where you could have a call, a letter, an email, a text going out at different points in time, all based on the donor's journey their timing aligned with their intent. So we no longer have to do just bulk campaigns based on our timing. Although Virtuous allows you to do that exceptionally well, we can create donor journeys that really uh, align with them and their timing. Hey, David, so we're example. running out of time. Of course, it's, there's a lot to cover, but this is a very quick high level. So now I'll kick it back to you. Yeah, I appreciate it, David. There's so much more to talk into and I shared a bunch of links in the chat, but our time is up. We are so grateful for you. We do not take your time lightly. I know Candace and Jenna hopefully would say the same thing. It's about coming together so we can learn to grow global generosity together. And I'm so grateful for Cosvox and the team for organizing this. So Candace, I'm going to kick it to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Noah and David, for sharing. This was so insightful. The chat is absolutely blowing up. People love this session really, really helpful and awesome tips. People are excited about that book. Um, thank you, Noah, for being here and for sharing. And a huge thank you to Virtuous for being a sponsor of the Digital Fundraising Summit to make it free for all of you to attend. So um, you uh, are so, uh, I'm so thankful that you're here and warmly welcomed and um, yeah. Awesome. Feels like we're just hanging out again, Candice. I like know. Collaborating and making things happen. So it's um, so fun. Enjoy the rest of the sessions. Definitely stick around for that mixology class. And Candice, I will chat with you later. Thanks, yeah. everyone. Sounds good.